Earlier this afternoon, backstage of the Sheffield City Hall, I caught up with Paul Humphreys and Andy McCluskey of OMD. Um, some time ago when we met, you described yourselves as potential bank clerks of music. Do you still think this applies to you? I think that was probably a reference to the, to the, the way people perceive the way we look. We're certainly not, uh, not your average sex symbol pop group, but we get by. <laughs> I find it ridiculous when you consider that you've had five albums, sixth album just released, uh, 14 singles released, of which 11 have been hits. I mean, that is quite some pedigree, so, isn't it? For, for a band that we, I mean, we never ever considered that we'd go past further than, you know, doing one album. For, I mean, for, for a band that to, we weren't really looking to have major success, we've certainly done okay. You've been a little bit um, uh, provocative in some of the titles of your songs. For instance, Enola Gay, mm -hmm. uh, for which uh, the press all leaped on you and said, what is all this about? Well, strangely enough, I mean, Enola Gay was not really a sort of a, an anti-nuclear song in a sense, although it was, it was about the aeroplane that dropped the very first atom bomb. Um, it actually came from a, an interest that we had with aeroplanes and, and warfare. We have written quite a lot of songs about war, but they're not sort of, they're not in praise of warfare. I think we're just quite taken by, interested in the lengths to which people go when they're involved in wars, you know. I'm interested in extremes of emotions. And so we'll write war songs and we'll write songs about strange historical characters who've had strange pasts like Joan of Arc. And, and we'll write about wars and things because they're sort of strong emotional things. You've never actually made a standpoint live, though, have you, on any um, very heavy political issue? Or have you? Um, no, I don't think so. I think the nearest we probably came to it last year was one of our favourite songs that we did a cover version of years ago was Waiting for the Man by the Velvet Underground, which of course is, is about drugs. And it was, uh, it was only last year we suddenly realised we were standing on stage playing this song and, and we'd grown up with it liking the song regardless of what it was about and we suddenly thought, well, hang on a minute, this heroin thing is getting all out of order and here we are standing on stage playing a song about waiting for the guy to score your heroin. So we had to yeah. make a few points on stage last year about that. And one other song title which has confused a lot of people, I think, Tesla Girls, Paul. What is that? <laughs> Who are they? Um, Where came... do I find them? <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> They're everywhere, exactly. I mean, it came from uh, us seeing a documentary. We got lots of, lots of uh, stuff out of documentaries. We saw a documentary on Nikola Tesla, the guy who basically invented the alternating current, and we thought, rather than write a very sort of scientific song about Nikola Tesla, we thought we'd write something about the, the, the girls who have, who have used his invention, but don't really know who he is, and that's a Tesla yeah. girl, so it's, it takes in a lot of girls. Yeah, and, and, and it's any woman who's ever watched a TV switched on an electric light, used an electric hairdryer, so it's, that's most of the female species, I think. <laughs> Let's hope that's the last time anyone asks you that question in that case. Um, we've got the new album out at the moment called Crush. Uh, after five albums, this being the sixth album, is there a time, do you think, when you'll actually run out of inspiration and ideas for songs? We've been expecting it to happen for the last six years. Uh, no, when you've, you've done your album and you've done the tour, it's never taken for granted in OMD that we're just going to continue, you know, get back on the treadmill and do the next album, the next album, until people are fed up with us. We sit down and say, well, have we got any ideas? Do we want to play together? And to our amazement, we, we've con wanted to continue to do that. And remarkably, this year, we've been more prolific than we've ever been. I and mean, I think we wrote... 20 odd songs for this LP. In normally, about two months. Yeah, yeah. normally we're scrounging together to get 10 to fit on the album. So, um, no, we don't seem to be in danger of running out of steam just yet. But the musical environment which OMD exists in has always been fairly electro synth. Do you think that style of music can continue? Or are you opening mm. it up to become more broad minded? <clears throat> well, I think we have really opened up. I think we, particularly after Architecture and Morality, I think we kind of really broadened our sort of. You know, we kind of took our blinkers off a little bit and realised that, you know, we, we'd always steered clear of like acoustic drums and guitars because we thought they were rock and roll. But really, w what we hated about them was was the way they were used. And I think it's it's not the instrument, it's not inherent in the instrument itself. It's in how it's used. And I think we realised that there are interesting ways to use drum kits and guitars mm -hmm. and very standard rock and roll instruments in in ways other than rock and roll. Do you think people who see you live for the first time are quite surprised to see a, a six piece? on the stage? I think, yeah, I think yeah. people, some, a lot of people still have the impression that there's just the two of us, actually, because myself and Paul started the band as a two-piece, but quite quickly we got fed up of just being two guys and a tape recorder on stage, <laughs> trusty old Winston, <laughs> and we expanded to a four-piece with uh, 
with Malcolm and Martin, who are basically OMD. We consider OMD to be a four-piece. And now on stage we've got Graham and Neil, the Weir brothers, so playing brass and anything else that we haven't got enough hands to play. Uh, so there's six of us on stage, and uh, it's quite nice that because there's sort of there's people to to sort of bounce and work off rather than just sort of standing there having to control your machinery. An OMD concert is quite an occasion because you do have that many hits to play with. Yet when you set off on the set, you come in with quite a bang, and then you almost seem to take your audience down. It's interesting. We usually start with the title track of the new LP, which is usually an instrumental or a strange piece, and it, I think it's quite nice to start slowly and, and wind up rather than come on with the magnesium flares and are you ready to rock, Kerrang? <laughs> and then it is hit after hit, isn't it? There's a fair few in there, yeah. The one song that perhaps is missing out of the live set is genetic engineering. Why? Um, I think basically because it sounded like World War Three on stage. <laughs> you have tried it then? <laughs> We've oh, tried yeah. it. We could never get it to sound right, could no, we? No, we, we, we played it on, on the Dazzle Ships tour from the album it came from, and we used, to, we used to start the set with a mime with semaphore flags and things, and then the lights would go out and we'd get over to do genetic engineering, which required a backing tech because it had typewriters and things on it, which you couldn't do on stage. And with the lights out, and we're all walking around with these damn flags in darkness, the number of times we missed the intro to Genetic Engineering, then we were all trying to guess where we were on the backing tape. <laughs> but I think we decided it was better it was off left out of the set. Actually. Disastrous, yeah. <laughs> People fighting in the darkness. Get out of my way, where's my drum kit? We used to kick each other as we walked across the stage. <laughs> but before we go, um, Liverpool is where you're from, and Liverpool is where you still have your home. Is that yeah. calculated, or is it something you felt you want to do? Is it from the heart, or is it from necessity? It's still home, really. I mean, it's we're not home, Liverpool, yeah. we're just outside, but I mean, that's, that's where we grew up and that, that's like where we like to be. Uh, the great thing about it is that we, particularly when we're writing songs, we like to sort of get away from the music business and just live like normal human beings, you know, which is hard to do in London because you're always available. If you're living yeah. in London, you know, the record company know exactly where you are and you can be just running around doing business all the time, whereas up in Liverpool you're really cut off and you can just sit and, and enjoy writing songs and just living like a normal person, which is great. Well, good luck anyway, and thanks for taking time out and enjoy the rest of the set. Pleasure. Thank you.